And so the passage concludes with the dedication of the temple in this massive mammoth sacrificial occasion. The king and all Israel with him offered sacrifices before the Lord. Solomon offered a sacrifice of fellowship offerings to the Lord, 22,000 cattle, 120,000 sheep and goats. Apart from anything else, it's hardly possible for us to imagine the stench that this would have created in Jerusalem. So the king and all the Israelites dedicated the temple of the Lord. On that same day, the king consecrated the middle part of the courtyard in front of the temple of the Lord. And there he offered burnt offerings, grain offerings, and the fat of the fellowship offerings, because the bronze altar before the Lord was too small to hold the burnt offerings, the grain offerings, and the fat of the fellowship offering. What's happening here is that the consecrated temple area has to be expanded in order to have the capacity for the sacrifices that are being offered here to the Lord. So Solomon observed the festival and all Israel with him, a vast assembly, people from Lebo, Hamath, to the Wadi of Egypt, that is, from the very north to the very south. They celebrated it before the Lord our God for seven days and seven days more, 14 days in all. They come to the end of the celebration of the festival. It was the festival of booths or tabernacles celebrating the days in which they had wandered in the wilderness and eventually had been brought out of the wilderness into the promised land. And it's like a congregation saying at uh, 8.15 on Sunday night, let's have more. And they stay on for another day. Let's have another service and another service. And in this occasion, the festival is such a festival of celebration that the people can't stop celebrating. They want more of this kind of celebration. And it goes on for another week. And on the following day, that is the 15th day, Solomon sent the people away. He was probably, apart from anything else, exhausted. They blessed the king and then went home. This is beautiful, isn't it? Joyful and glad in heart for all the good things the Lord had done for his servant David and his people, Israel. Now we've been discovering here in 1 Kings that there is a pattern to this opening section of 1 Kings, which through 1 Kings chapter 11 takes us from the death of David to the death of Solomon. The opening chapters of the section, chapters 1, 2, and 3, basically are concerned with the question of who will succeed the great King David. And the answer that we are given to that question is that King Solomon will. Solomon has been marked out by the Lord. He has been appointed by David, and he has been given the special gifts that he needs for the service to which he has been called. He has sought wisdom And he has been given not merely earthly and political wisdom, but supernatural and spiritual wisdom by the Lord. And the author of 1 Kings has been at pains to demonstrate how full that wisdom is. It is a wisdom that enables him to discern human motivation. And we've had an illustration of that. It's a wisdom that enables him wisely to deal politically and internationally. It's an intellectual wisdom. He becomes the intellectual giant of the ancient Near East. The scientists of this period are amazed at his ability to classify knowledge in the universe. And in all these different ways, Solomon appears as the supreme man, the supreme Israelite. He is, in a sense, portrayed by the author of 1 Kings in these early chapters as a kind of new Adam. He is everything that a man was intended to be intellectually, in terms of his ability to deal not only with the high and mighty, but with a couple of prostitutes, with total integrity, in the way in which he has this understanding of the natural order. Adam was called to subdue the earth, not in the sense that he was to stamp upon it, 
but that he was to understand it and he was to employ it for God's glory. And Solomon is portrayed here as the supreme man in history until this time who has recaptured in whom there has been restored this wisdom that was lost by the fall. And then, of course, the high point of this wisdom is Solomon's obedience to God in building the temple. And this is such a significant event in Solomon's life, indeed such a significant event in the whole history of Israel, that it's the single event that takes up most chapters in his life, five, six, seven, eight, and into the beginning of nine. We've seen how he's planned the temple, how he's built the temple, and how he has furnished the temple. And now we come to the fourth of those stages, the great day of the dedication of the temple. And we can try and summarize what takes place here in chapter 8, I think, under four headings. And let me give them to you because it looks highly unlikely that I'll be able to give the substance that should flow from each of them to you this evening. First of all, in verses 1 to 13, there is this extraordinary manifesting of God's presence. And that is really the central theme of this chapter, the manifesting of God's presence. Second, in verses 14 to 21, there is the fulfilling of God's promises. In the extensive prayer in verses 22 to 53, there is the seeking of God's blessing. And in verses 54 to 66, there is the consecrating of God's people. First of all, then, in verses 1 to 13, the manifesting of God's presence. It is the seventh month. And one of the peculiarities of this opening statement is that we are not told the seventh month of what year. Did Solomon spend only another 11 months before he then dedicated the temple? Or is there something going on here that there's an extensive period of time, perhaps years, perhaps because he is so engaged in the building of the palace that it's some time before the temple is dedicated. Perhaps quite deliberately, the author of 1 Kings is saying to us in these opening verses, as we've already seen indication he does from time to time, everything that I'm telling you isn't quite as simple and straightforward as you might think. But whatever the precise year, the precise month was the seventh month. Remember a few weeks ago when we were studying Haggai chapter 2, we were in the seventh month, and the seventh month was a particularly crowded month. It was the month of the Feast of Tabernacles. It was the month of the Day of Atonement. And all of these things for Solomon come to this glorious climax in the midst of Uh, I suppose the ancient analogy to something like the Keswick Convention when the people of God are gathered in joyful, festal assembly. There is this unique event takes place in the history of God's people. And this great building that God has commanded David's son to build is now dedicated. And in order that it may be dedicated and its significance be clearly seen, there is a ritual that takes place. The Ark of the Covenant is brought from some location in the city of David in Jerusalem. It is brought up into the temple precincts. And not only the Ark of the Covenant, you'll notice, but something of which we never hear again. The surrounding accoutrements in which the Ark of the Covenant had been placed in these last 480 years since the people had left the great bondage time of Egypt. The Ark of the Lord is brought up and the tent of meeting in which the Ark of the Lord over all of these years had been carefully and religiously placed, is also brought up. 
and now suddenly it disappears from the face of history. What's the explanation? The explanation is this, that when God moves on to a next stage in the unfolding of his purposes for the worship of his people, the instrument that has been used in the previous stage is now derelict, must be folded up and put away. Because God will have no rival to the place in which he means to be worshipped. And that's a standing pattern in Scripture. The next time this will happen under the providential hand of God is, of course, in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. What happens when Christ comes? The true ark of the covenant enters into the temple of God, in which the pictorial Ark of the Covenant had formerly been kept, what must happen? That tent of meeting in these days was folded away. It was of no further use. And exactly the same thing happens in the days of our Lord Jesus Christ in the first century. The sign of it, of course, takes place at the time of his death when the veil of the curtain is torn in two from top to bottom. We often think of that as God opening up the new and living way into his presence, and that's perfectly true. But there's another aspect to it. What was God doing when the curtain was torn from the top to the bottom? He was desecrating the temple. That's what he was doing. He was, as it were, symbolically doing in A.D. 33 or A.D. 30, whenever our Lord Jesus Christ died, he was symbolically doing what would happen historically in 70 A.D. when the whole temple would collapse. He was folding away those places in which he could be worshipped acceptably until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the reason why, of course, in the book of Kings, there is a note that is struck again and again. The tabernacle has been folded away. There is only one place in which the people of God are to assemble for true worship, and that is in the temple in Jerusalem. And so every king who appears on the scene is judged, among other things, by this one question. What did he do with the high places? What did he do with every potential rival to the temple in Jerusalem? Did he remove them and destroy them? Or did he keep them? And we are given in the New Testament the fulfillment of that pattern in which God himself comes down supernaturally at the time of Jesus and providentially through the Romans in 70 AD and makes it crystal clear that he has only one temple in the universe, only one, and he means to brook no rivals. There is no other temple in which we can have access to God than in the temple that seemed to be destroyed by Roman soldiers and was raised triumphant by God on the third day. That's why Jesus says to the woman at the well in John chapter 4, the time is coming and now is, when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will the Father be seeking worship. He will be seeking worship that comes in the power of the Holy Spirit and is therefore focused in the one who has come in the power of that Spirit, Jesus Christ himself. And so we not only recognize that there is an event in history here, but there is a pattern of God's working. And all of it is saying to us, God throughout all the ages has had only one way. He has not given us a multitude of ways to come to him. He didn't give the people in the wilderness a multitude of ways to come to him. He built an ark for them, and there was a tent of meeting. In the days of Solomon, the temple was built, and it was there that they were to meet with God. In the days of the new covenant in our Lord Jesus Christ, that temple was folded away, and the only place in the universe 
in which God can be acceptably worshipped now is in the new temple of our Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, the glory of that, and you get almost a foretaste of this when Solomon prays for those who are strangers and have come in, the glory of that is that everything that we see only in terms of the punctuation marks of the Old Testament occasionally reminding us that God has a deep concern for those who are not Israelites, the glorious fulfillment of that is that Jesus Christ is the temple who can be worshipped and through whom we can come to God at any place and time in the entire universe you see there is a movement towards the internationalizing of the worship of God. And all this, of course, is given this extraordinary expression in the manifestation of the glory cloud, the Shekinah cloud that fills the temple of the Lord that had appeared in the days of the Exodus, you remember, that appears here that perhaps we are meant to understand appears also in Isaiah's vision. When this cloud fills the temple and he feels as though he's almost suffocating. And which, of course, reappears again when? At the transfiguration of our Lord Jesus Christ. And a voice comes from heaven as the three disciples are caught up with Jesus in this glory cloud. And as a result, they see Jesus shining, transfigured, because he's been in the glory cloud, and there's a voice that comes from heaven and says what? It says, essentially, this is the new temple. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. It's a reminder to all the people you see that the priests have to stop their ministry In verse 11, they couldn't perform their service because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled his temple. In a way, it's saying this to us. That's the only thing that matters. It's the only thing that matters. The priests can cease exercising their ministry. We can all sit down and shut up and do nothing if only the glory cloud of God fills the place. And if the glory cloud of God doesn't fill the place, then all of our ministry at the end of the day falls short of the glory of God. How interesting, isn't it, that these people experience just momentarily on four or five or six occasions throughout all those years in the Old Testament history they experienced the sense of the glory of God filling the place. And it is our conviction that as we seek Christ in the power of the Spirit, every time the glory of God fills the place, heaven came down and glory filled my soul. So there is the manifesting of God's presence Secondly, there is the fulfilling of God's promises, and that emerges in Solomon's beautiful doxology, in which he gives the most eloquent expression. And we ought to notice it because it is so simple and so beautiful. He gives the most eloquent expression to the faithfulness of God. In verse 15, then Solomon said, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who with his own hand has fulfilled what he promised with his own mouth. Isn't that great? It says everything by pointing us to two parts of the divine anatomy. Whatever God says with his mouth, he will do with his hand. And that is the faith into which Solomon has been born and into which he has now been reared, made it his own. What a great thing for him to see that what God promised with his mouth in his word, he will fulfill with his hand in the outworking of providence. We need to learn to live in that faith and say it to ourselves over and over again that it may be clear to us 
if he has given the promise of his mouth. Remember what Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Whatever he has said in his mouth, and this, said Jesus, this is his mouth. This is where we hear what his mouth is saying. And everything he has said with his mouth, he will do with his hand. It's significant that Solomon says that in the context of prayer and praise because it's actually the essence of prayer. It is what gives us assurance in prayer. It is what the Bible calls the prayer of faith. The prayer of faith is not me spinning off some wild idea about what God might do, but coming to God and saying, you have promised with your mouth, therefore fulfill with your hand. And Solomon, of course, has seen this, and he goes on to pray about it in several different dimensions. In verse 20, the Lord has kept the promise he made. I have succeeded David, my father, and sit on his throne. The Lord has kept the promise he made, and I have built the temple for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. But there's another aspect to that promise. The first part of it was that David would have a son. The second part of it was that David's son would build the temple. And the third part of it was that David would never fail to have a man sit before God on the throne of Israel. And it's to that, you'll notice, that he now begins to turn. But I want, before we turn to the third thing that we see in this passage... Just to notice, and I'll come back to this in a moment, just to notice that already in verses 20 to 21, we see a further indication given to us by the author of the book of Kings that it's just possible that everything here isn't quite what it seems to be. Well, let me be tantalizing and just move on. I'll come back to that in a minute or two. The manifesting of God's presence, the fulfilling of God's promises. And then in this lengthy section, verses 22 to 53, the seeking of God's blessing. And this is the great prayer of dedication. Verse 22, Solomon stood before the altar in front of the whole assembly of Israel, spread out his hands towards heaven. And he begins to pray, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth below. You who keep your covenant of love with your servants who continue wholeheartedly. Don't you wish you could pray like this? Well, here is his great, great prayer. And there's a secret to it. There is a, there's a biblical secret to it that helps us to understand what's going on here. What we find in this prayer is that Solomon is going back to the covenant that God had made with his people at Sinai. And he is essentially saying to God, what you said with your mouth, display with your hand. And if you have some knowledge of particularly the book of Deuteronomy in which that covenant is expounded, you'll realize, again, that Solomon isn't just making up these petitions. He's not saying, what can we pray about now? What can we pray about today? He has himself gone back to the Scriptures, gone back to the book of Deuteronomy, and he has seen the pattern in which God has related himself to his people, the covenant pattern. And the covenant pattern was this. God gave his commitment to his people. He called his people to faith. He warned his people against disobedience. I've set before you the way of life and the way of death, he said, so choose the way of life. He unreservedly committed himself in covenant relationship to his people, but the implications of that covenant relationship the outworking of it, of course, depended on the way in which his people responded to that covenant love and grace. If they responded in faith and trust and obedience, then they entered into the blessings of the covenant. 
With these blessings I will bless you, he said. But if they turned away in disobedience and faithlessness, in indifference to his covenant, then he said, if you turn away from me, you'll wander in a desert place. You'll experience my judgment and my cursing. And especially at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, there are all these promises of blessing and threatenings of cursing, and they all depend on whether the people respond in faith or turn away in disobedience. And like Elijah after him, Solomon is taking hold of that relationship, that covenant relationship and that covenant dynamic. And he's saying, Lord, make it work among our people. Help us to be faithful. And if we are faithless, please fulfill the promises you gave to the faithless ones who become repentant and penitent. And restore us to your fellowship. Restore us to your grace. And so if I may outline it in verses 22 to 24, He praises God for his covenant faithfulness. In 25 and 26, he makes petition to God for his covenant steadfastness. In 27 to 30, he expresses his desire for God's covenant presence. And in verses 31 to 54, he appeals to God in this sevenfold series of petitions to show his covenant grace to the people. And you'll notice right at the end of this prayer something that tells us a great deal about what was happening in Solomon's soul. Notice the posture he adopts described in verse 22. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in front of the whole assembly. He spread out his hands. And then when he's finished praying, when Solomon had finished all these prayers and supplications to the Lord, where was he now? He rose from before the altar of the Lord where he'd been kneeling with his hands spread out toward heaven. And we are really, I think, meant to see as, as, we, as we read that and remember he was standing when he began to pray and he's kneeling when he finishes. We're meant to see a man who is being bowed down even in the midst of his own prayer as the awesomeness of God's Holiness and the wonder of God's grace simultaneously come upon him. That's what bows us down before the Lord physically. The people of God in many different places have spoken about the way in which they have been caught up into the presence of God in prayer, that they felt they've been forced to their knees. They've sensed the glory of God so weighty upon them that they've been forced to their knees. Wouldn't that have been something to witness before? This was the king. This was the king. What would that do, incidentally, to our nation if we saw that? If we saw that? You sometimes think, don't you, it must be absolutely ghastly to be the heir to the throne. But what if the heir to the throne became like this man? And before the whole nation was bowed before Almighty God in prayer. And if you can imagine that, then you can imagine something of the sheer wonder of this scene in which Solomon finds himself, perhaps without even knowing what has happened to him, bowed down before God in prayer. A few months ago, some of us were down at Ian Hamilton's farewell, and Phil Hare told us this wonderful story about the first time he'd preached in uh, Loudoun Church. And when he'd finished praying the opening prayer, he thought his voice sounded a bit strange, and he opened his eyes. He couldn't see anybody, and he wondered where the congregation had gone. And then it dawned on him he had actually physically turned round in his prayer, And his back was to the congregation. He was looking at the back wall of the church. That's why he couldn't see the congregation. He thought that the rapture had taken place. Now, we all laughed, but it was only a later reflection I thought to myself, what was happening in Phil's life? What instinct took hold of him when he was praying that he turned round? 
and instead of facing the congregation, faced with the congregation. I have little doubt it must have been an instinct a little like this. Many times, those of us who are ministers would rather not be facing the congregation, but when all heads are bowed and all eyes are closed, you want to turn round and sense that we're all bowing down before the majesty on high. So the manifesting of God's presence, the fulfilling of God's promises, the seeking of God's blessing, And at the end of the chapter, verses 54 to 66, the consecrating of God's people. And you see how he does this. He does it longing for God's presence. Oh, he praises God that not one word has failed of all the good promises. And he longs, notice, that the Lord will be with them as he was with our fathers. Again, it's the same principle. The only thing, my friends, that matters at the end of the day is that the Lord is with you. It's the only thing that matters. Everything else can crumble around you, but if the Lord is with you, if the Lord is with you, and this is what he's longing for, the Lord's presence. He's praying for the people's wholehearted obedience. Verse 58, may he turn our hearts, may he incline our hearts to him to walk in all his ways and keep the commands, decrees, and regulations he gave our fathers. He's praying for intimate fellowship. Oh, he prays that the Lord will give them that intimate fellowship with him. And he's praying for the internationalizing of God's Great mercy. And you notice then at the end in verse 61, but your hearts must be fully committed to the Lord our God to live by his decrees and obey his commands as at this time. This unconditional covenant that God has made, I will be your God, you will be my people, does not put them on easy street but on their toes. Because he has laid hold of them, then his holiness and justice are exquisitely near to them, as well as his grace and his love. And so they must be careful. Their hearts must be fully committed. Well, what a day this must have been. The people's hearts lifted upwards in worship and fellowship, Verse 62, in the offering of these sacrifices, the glory of God, in a sense, extending outwards because they have so much fellowship with God in these fellowship offerings in which, of course, they participate that the king is to consecrate the middle part of the courtyard in front of the temple as well as the temple. And the blessing extends, if I can put it this way, not only upwards and outwards but also downwards because the people are joyful and glad in heart for all the good things the Lord has done. But, and there is a but, I think you notice it potentially in the very opening verse that gives us no date and leaves us wondering how long from the completion of the temple to the actual dedication of the temple I think it becomes a little clearer in verse 20 and 21. You ever looked at a letter you've written, and as you've read over it, you've thought, I need to rewrite this for one reason. There are far too many eyes in it. You're writing as though you are showing an interest in someone else, but the whole letter is full of yourself. And that begins to emerge here. Yes, he's saying, the Lord has done these things. The Lord has kept the promise he made. I have succeeded, David. I sit on the throne. Just as the Lord has promised, and I have built the temple for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. I have provided a place there for the ark. It's subtle, isn't it? But it's real, and and I think Solomon can't actually keep it in that in the midst of this context in which the Lord 
has fulfilled his promises. Somehow or another, he can't get himself quite out of the center. It appears again, I think, in verse 23. Solomon stands, he says, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth below. You who keep your covenant of love with your servants, who continue wholeheartedly in your way. Now the people who read this when it was written, and we ourselves, they were all after Solomon's time. And here's Solomon praying a prayer with a full heart, caught up in the presence of God. I have no doubt whatsoever genuinely worshiping God in the power of the Spirit. And yet there's this but, there's this nevertheless, there's this little hint that the man who is praying these things isn't everything that he himself is praying that the people will be because he didn't continue wholeheartedly in the Lord's ways. It appears again in verse 25, Now, Lord God of Israel, keep for your servant David my father the promises. You shall never fail to have a man sit before me on the throne of Israel if only your sons are careful in all they do to walk before me as you have done. And it's another little hint. Here's a man who for all his devotion to the Lord had aspects of his life in which he had ceased to be really careful to be obedient to him. It appears again, I think, in verse 58. There's another hint. May he turn our hearts to him. May he incline our hearts to him to walk in all his ways and keep the commands, decrees, and regulations he gave to our fathers. You probably are familiar with the words that appear later in 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 4, where the same language is used. As Solomon grew old, his wives inclined his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father had been. And there's another hint in verse 61. He says to the people, your hearts must be fully committed to the Lord our God, to live by his decrees and obey his commands as at this time. And this poor dear man failed to be what he urged the people to be and prayed to the Lord that they too might be. Dear friends, we need to try and take this in that it really is possible, really is possible to be devoted to the Lord It really is possible to know the presence of the Lord, to be a fruitful servant of the Lord, and yet never really have dealt with these neverthelesses that seem here to plague Solomon's life. And the lesson, and we will surely come to this of Solomon's life, is this that if we don't deal with them, they are going to deal with us. As one of the old divines used to say, you can be crystal clear on this. If you don't go about putting to death those remnants of indwelling sin that would lead you astray from the Lord, you can be sure they will go about putting you to death. That's a melancholy note to finish on, isn't it? But we need to remember this. 1 John chapter 3, the reason the Son of God appeared, the reason the Son of God appeared, was what? To destroy the works of the devil. And if that is why he appeared, then we live in a day of greater light than Solomon. We live in a day of greater grace than Solomon. 
we're able to appeal to our Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit to enable us to put to death everything that would stand in the way of our wholehearted, unreserved consecration to Jesus Christ. And it is in his kindness that he speaks to us about these things totally privately. You have no idea, do you, what's really going on in my mind and heart as I stand here and talk to you. And I have no idea what's going on in your mind and heart. But we all sit under a word like this and recognize that there are still these remnants of indwelling sin that we go too easy on. And sometimes because we're the king, we're the king. It could never happen to me. I'm the king. But we can never say to indwelling sin, don't you know who I am? It knows only too well. So here we are in the heights and it exposes the depths. And what a great thing to know more clearly than Solomon that a greater than Solomon has come who was free from sin and yet who feels our infirmities has the power to deliver us and the love to feel with us. Let's go then not to Solomon's temple, but to Christ. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word, for its vitality and power. Thank you that in coming to Christ we have begun to discover, as he must have discovered as a boy, just how fascinating and full your word is and how instructive. And we pray that through it you will not only instruct us, but change us. And as we look forward, as we really do look forward to praising Jesus Christ for coming into this world in these next few days, we pray that we may yield ourselves to him in a new way, without reservation, and discover his amazing grace once again. Bless us, Lord. Bless our homes and families. Bless our lives and our various ministries. Take us home safely. Take us home rejoicing, for Jesus' sake.